my guest tonight, actor, filmmaker, magician, and my friend from way back, Cameron Francis. Cameron, it's good to see you. Fred, it is great to see you. Thank you so much for um, allowing me to do this. And for, am I your first guest for this? Your first guest. This is the very first show. I thought, man, <laughs> right out the gate. I hope we're pushing all the right buttons here. I think we are. Yeah, that is so cool. Well, thank you for being here. I'm going to flatter you, embarrass you a little bit with the resume right off the bat so everyone can get to know you a little bit. You've been an <laughs> actor's equity member for 20 years. You've acted on theaters in New York, including Off-Broadway, Washington, D.C., Orlando, among others. You've appeared in Hollywood films such as Never Back Down. You've been directed by famous directors like Kevin Smith. We'll get to him in a moment. You're a magician who's performed in the U.S. and throughout Europe. You're a voiceover actor. You're a screenwriter. You're a filmmaker. You're a working artist who, just like me, I, we, we've worked to turn this passion into a living, Yeah, to say the least. You've done a lot. I want to start, though, with the audition process. Okay. Because that's apt, because that's where we met. Yes. How long ago was that? That was 2000? That was, two, I want to say it was 2005. I think that's um, about because I, let's see, I started with Melanie Hurt in like late 2004. The, the Hurt Agency was your The agency. Hurt Agency, yeah. right? Uh, which is no longer, uh, sadly, no longer around. Melanie, ret I mean, you know, good for her. She retired. Great. Um, but um, uh, yeah, so I started with her. And then the first thing I did there, kind of out of the gate, was like this industrial thing. And then I feel like by owner was either my second or third, like kind of like bigger thing that I got. And uh, yeah, it was my first job working in commercials. And it's funny. I was just talking to my friend, really? Gordon Meyer, who directed those commercials, who's directed. Wow. I don't know how many commercials, hundreds, right. I don't know, a lot. And yeah. he says, I have no recollection, says Gordon, of those commercials. So, but I remember <laughs> it well because we yeah. met. I was behind the camera. You yeah. were obviously in front of the camera. And, yeah. and whenever Hollywood turns the lens on itself and, <laughs> and shows that process, the actors are always the tortured souls. Yeah, forced to dance for their dinner, and the guys yeah. on this side of the camera were the heartless bastards. Right, doing yes. this torturing. So, what do you think about the process? I hope it's not that way for everywhere, everybody, all the time. But what do you think about the audition? No, process? you know, it's funny. Actually, it's funny. I was just thinking that I got, ah, the, the the good old days when we actually went in person to audition for the initial audition. We actually had to drive yeah. out to wherever it was. It seems so long ago. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, it. You know what? It. It. I don't, it, mm, I don't really mind, mind it. Um, yeah. It's fine. It's just, uh, you know, it's like anything. It's like, it's, it's, you know, they always say the, in acting your job, the job is auditioning. Right. And so, yeah, some days you're just like, Ugh, I really don't want to go to this thing today. I really don't want to. It's not that we don't want the job. It's just that we're, you know, we're human. We, you know, sometimes we don't feel like driving two hours. Um, but, uh, but no, I mean, I, Overall, I like it. The only time, the only bad experiences I've had auditioning are when I have, when I'm auditioning for people who are rude, basically, or, uh, you know, are, are, are um, yeah, aren't are nice people. But, um, but you were very friendly. I, I vaguely remember the, the audition for By Owner. Um, yeah. Because did you, now, no, no, when we, when I auditioned, that was definitely on tape, right? But then it, filming. You know, we, we, yep, it was this stuff for you kids at home. We shot that commercial on film on 16 millimeter film, which is, yeah. which is what agencies would have been using at that time. Right. Video wasn't then what it would soon become. Right. Is it different? Is it different auditioning commercials, movies, theater is, is one medium better suited to the actor or is it, is it tough all it, the way around? It really depends on the project. I find commercial auditioning to be, to, because usually commercials, are you're you're you know you're you're selling something. I mean, yeah. so the so what they want, what a lot of people want you to do is, it isn't necessarily like naturalistic real life kind of stuff all the time, right? Like sometimes it's kind of strange, and you know you you uh, have to react to things that you would never react to in real life, or you have to put a smile on your face and smile all the way through, where probably you wouldn't do that in real life. So it's They're written by ad writers. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So it's a little more abstract, I think, is the only way I can say it, is that I find that commercial auditions tend to be, you know, 
not counterintuitive, but just just sort of you have to know it, it, it helps immensely. The more information you get from the casting director about what they want, it helps you immensely because if if you don't know, um, it can be very frustrating. So you do something like, yeah, we'll try this or this. And you know, it's sort of like, well, wait a minute, what, what are you going for here? So I always find it helpful when uh, I get as much information as possible. Um, for, in terms of like, balance. I'm sorry, yeah? yeah what the, what's the balance between what you just said, finding out what they're looking for versus right. you get a sense of that injecting your own ideas? Yeah. 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 So, so it, it, I mean, when I say that, I don't mean I want it spoon fed to me, like tell me what to do for each thing. I just want to have like the tone um, and uh, you know, and, and a good casting director will say that was great, but this time just like do it like this, like with this attitude or like, you know, really you're more frustrated by this or whatever. So you go, ah, got it. And then you can inject your own, whatever you bring to it, into it. And that's the whole thing, right? It's about, I mean, you know, it's that's what acting is all about is bringing your own perspective into whatever, you know, they're you're trying to do. So. Um, so, yeah. Now, in terms of film and TV, it tends to be a little more that it tends to be a little more, you know. Uh, it, I mean, again, it depends what you're auditioning for. But for the most part, a lot of it's very like, right, we are. This is a scene. Here's your given circumstances, you know, and now do it like, you know, very natural. It tends to be very naturalistic, especially these days. People want stuff really low key and stuff like that for, you know, for yeah. fun TV, so. Um, I, I can yeah. say having conducted uh, countless commercial audition sessions is that there's a certain consistency with what I say to every person because to make it fair or to make it honest, yeah. everyone should get the same shot. Right, uh, right. I, I personally like invention. Yeah. Especially, I'll admit this, even if you don't get the part, but you do something really interesting, I'll probably yeah. steal it. And yeah. <laughs> so you'll be watching a commercial that maybe you didn't get and say, well, yeah. I, I did it just like that. Right. Which, and, you know, and, and and you're absolutely, and that's the other thing. I mean, and, and, you know, I've learned that over the years because when I first started, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I was just, you know, auditioning and, but, you know, I, I realized I was like, oh, you know, it, I tend to, you know, do better when I add my own, my own flavor, my own special sauce to the audition, whatever that is, you know, uh, and whatever, you know, happens, you know, whatever comes out organically in the moment, even if it's not on the page, it usually, you know, it's like, you can see, I mean, I can see it in your eyes or whoever, you know, whoever I'm reading for, you're like, Oh, that seemed to like hit them a certain way. So that's always cool when that happens. Um, I do remember this about you with that commercial, the buy owner commercial and, we can actually queue it up. I can, I can, you know what, let, let's we do it. Dare we try? Let's try to push let's some. Try it, man. Yeah. Yeah. We, we've got the technology. Um, <laughs> we, I've got to push my own buttons here, but when yeah. <laughs> Joe Rogan doesn't have to push his, but yeah, I'm not going to push your buttons, man. I'm just not going to no. do it. It's going to go with the flow. Let's see here. Yeah. It's a fun spot. Is what, what, what I remember and we'll, we'll scroll down. I'll try to talk and, and operate the board at the same time here. Sure. What I remember is that you did something. You, you did the part. You did what everybody asked for. You did your own. And then you did something. You made a gesture. And uh, it was funny. You could, It was way over the top for television. Right. I mean, let's, I mean, it would have been, it was PG-13 rated at, at, at least. But you did it and it made everyone at the agency laugh. Yeah, yeah, there we go. So something, I mean, and it was well within the what the character might have done. Yeah. So though it would never make it into the spot, it did yeah. imprint you. And so maybe a lesson here is, hey, you even if you don't get the part, there's something that someone might remember next time. Oh, that guy. He's yeah. funny. I have a part for him. So here yeah. I am on your YouTube page here. I was looking for, where would I, where might I find? My, my commercial reel? Yeah. Uh, you know what? My <laughs> acting website might have it. It's definitely on my acting website. If you okay. go to, well, let's let, let I'll, I'll cue that up in the background here when you get rolling. Sure. And we'll sure. Come sure. Back sure. You know what I remember about that shoot, which is really funny is that, you know, we were just trying to figure out when we we're actually doing it, how sort of quote unquote drunk should I appear? <laughs> um, and so at one point, cause the line is, uh, I think I call my brother-in-law the famous defense attorney. And I think I said, the flamous defense attorney and everybody <laughs> loved that, but they were like, yeah, but it might not, it might be a little too weird. <laughs> you know, I just remember the, the crew, 
Everyone laughed. Everyone enjoyed that joke, but I think it was maybe a little over the top for that particular spot. They were by owner commercials. They were yeah. written by my friend, Tom Vanderclip, yeah. who has been a huge mentor to me. I'm buttering up because eventually I'd like hitting him up because eventually I'd like yeah. him to be on this show. Yeah, uh, he had He's done everything in the creative world at, in the advertising industry. And right. so they were funny, but they required acting ability. Yeah. You couldn't be a clown. And, right. and the reason why I think you got the part and, and maybe it's some of that stuff you made up on the spot was because you could play it for laughs without dominating and just making it silly. And it worked. It was. It was yeah. What I was looking for. Yeah. That was, it was such an interesting one of my, especially for one of my first commercials, it was such an interesting thing because there was that sort of delicate balance between way over the top. You know, you don't want to go way over the top, but you don't want to be so subtle that it doesn't read either. So it was this kind of like weird balancing act. And, you know, I watch it now and I'm actually like, yeah, it was good. You know, I think I, I, think I pulled it off all right. You know, I mean, I, I'm my own worst critic, so I I kind of cringe at everything I do. But, but you know, I thought I did all right there. I, I thought it was pretty funny. Um, and certainly you've, you've gone on and you've gotten a lot of parts here. Uh, one of them I want to talk about just kind of moving up in the world a little bit is sure. you were cast in the movie Never Back Down. Yeah, 2008. So it was a few years later. Yeah, yeah. And I, I remember, I remember talking with you, and you got that. I was over the moon. Uh, yeah, because I know it's a big yeah. deal. Even if it's a, yeah. they, there are no small parts. Uh, right, so right. Not a movie like this. So, how did you get that role? Never back down. Uh, is it fair to say was it was uh, a kind of a martial arts movie? I want to say it's a, it's a tougher, mm -hmm. more hip, violent version of Karate Kid. Yes, uh, and it, it was one of the. It was a it was an MMA kind of a movie. Yeah. Um, what's fu what's funny about it is that now I get um, I've heard from people who are like, yeah, I love that movie when I was younger because I mean it came out what two thousand eight at this point, and they're like, it was one of the first MMA. It was like one of my favorite movies. It was one of the first yeah. MMA movies, and I'm like, oh, so like I mean I don't know if it you know it's not like cult, but like there's definitely people that really like that movie, and and I think that's really cool to be a part of that. Um, but how I got it was just. I mean, I, it was just another audition. I think I went, it was funny though, cause they really, I went into, I think it was, was it Mark Mullen who cast that one? And anyway, I went in for it and they asked us to wear scrubs for the audition. I didn't have any. So I went to a, like a Walmart right before. And the only thing they had were like extra large scrubs and it swam all over me, but I wore it anyway. <laughs> and I went in there with these gigantic scrubs and um, the scene was actually written quite differently for the audition. It was actually a lot more involved. There were parents involved, there was all kinds of things. And I was the ER, ER doctor. And so I did it. And the, here's what's really funny about it. I did it and they kept like giving me adjustments and I did the adjustments and I, I was like, I guess I'm giving them what they're, I, I, I didn't know. And I walked out of there and I thought, yeah, that wasn't that great. I'm definitely not getting this. Cause it was just, I just felt like I was floundering. I felt like it was just okay, you know? And just then a few weeks later, I found out I, or, yeah, it was a few weeks later, I found out I booked it. Um, no callback or anything, just, you know. Right. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't a small movie. I mean, according to IMDb, no. $20 million budget. $20 million budget. Not exactly, budget. Not exactly uh, yeah. a lightweight there. No. It made box office. $40 it did. So it, it I mean, actually, I'm yeah. sure it's done more because it's a cable favorite. Uh, hopefully yeah, I've got the there. residuals to prove that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you deserve it. Yeah. I it's still get residuals. Good thing, good thing we're not in it for the money. Yeah, right? exactly. No, I mean, there. it's not, I mean, honestly, it's very little money, but it's just cool to see that like, it still plays on cable a lot overseas. It's still, it's very popular on like, I don't know, Swedish television or something. Like I get these little, these little checks here and there for it. Um, but what was cool about it is, it was my first SAG like speaking role in a film. Like I was, you know, I had been, a SAG, not SAG extra, but an extra in a SAG film way, way, way long, 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 long time ago before that. But that was my first, this was actually my first SAG role. And um, and the cool thing is too, is in that scene with me, it's Evan Peters, who has yeah. now like gone on to do really cool stuff, including, you know, a lot of Marvel stuff. And Amber Heard, who of course is Johnny Depp's you know, ex and uh, has done uh, Aquaman. So Basically, I've worked with two titans of the uh, comic book uh, movie world. I got to be in a scene with them when they were is, not. Is that scene? Is that scene on your YouTube? We should play that one for. It's you. it's on it's in my reel. Yeah, it's on my. I think you were starting to before okay, we. Let's see. Before. So if I go to, uh, oh, acting. Wait, you, okay, let's do this. Hmm. So, um, 
it was fun. Yeah, the, I, we know now that move action type movies do play well overseas because they're not yep. they don't rely on understanding the nuance of American right. culture. They right. just know, okay, that's the guy who's getting yeah. bullied and he's got to beat up that guy. All yeah. right, let's see if we can't add this here. All right. Yeah. So Cameron Francis is acting real. Yeah, that's it. It's getting real. Acting real. <laughs> we're, we're, I'm just acting real on this thing. That's all. That's what's oh, here we go. Okay. There right. we go. Yeah, you can bag it up there. There yeah. we got here. All right. Go. This is kind of right. like, are we dating ourselves by, you remember the show Mystery Science Theater 3000? I love Mystery Science Theater 3000. One of my all-time favorite shows. Yeah. Well, kids, there was a show where all it was was a bunch of guys sitting in small screens, watching a big screen, cracking over yeah. the movie the whole time. And that's probably what we can do right here. And, you know, so they, they've done new ones on Netflix. I don't know if you've seen them, but there's new episodes on Netflix. And it's good. They, they remade good. The Karate Kid. They remade Red Dawn. They Should they have? I don't know. Probably not. They did. I, I haven't seen it. <laughs> it's good. I don't get out much. Let's take a look at this here. Sure. Fractured ribs, six stitches inside his lip, and a broken nose. That must have been really full. You're going to be fine. We'll have to keep you here overnight for observation. And that's it. <laughs> like maybe, maybe eight, 20 seconds of screen time, you know, maybe. But it was a big deal to me, man. It was cool. You know, just it's a big deal. Look, I, I, I know the movie well enough to know when it comes on cable. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. Yeah. Campbell's part's coming up. Yeah. Play. It's when it, poor, poor Evan Peters gets the, you know, stuff beaten out of him. And that's <laughs> right after that. That's when I come on. So, um, yeah, man, it was cool. And this next scene, that was directed by uh, Tiaka Watiti. Um, I'm going to say his name wrong. I'm going to butcher it. Tiaka yeah. Watiti, is that how you say his name? So I'm it was sure. sort of the in-betweeners. And this was, was okay. this is before what we do in the shadows or like, you know, obviously way before Thor or any of that. And he just happened to be directing this episode that I was in of this TV show. And I had, I didn't know who he was at the time. He just seemed like a cool dude, you know, uh, from, had an accent. I didn't know anything about him. But l years later, when I looked up who directed the episode, I found out that it, it was him. And I was like, oh my God, like, I'm, you know, that's amazing. I got to work with this guy and I didn't even know it at the time. You know? I'm going to set this up and say that this actually is, to me, vintage Cameron Francis, because <laughs> you, if you overplay this or if you go the wrong direction, the yeah. scene probably isn't going to hold yeah. It's moment and it's integrity that it has. And then it's been, let's watch. Yeah. Protect it too much. Uh, I don't think he'll be allowed in. Are you serious? What, because it doesn't look like the rest of us? <laughs> no, because we don't allow flip flops or jeans. You guys got a protocol? Cool. <laughs> yeah. So we headed to the golf course. Where the promise of even more embarrassing. So what's funny about that, you were saying that about how that was played. That scene is cut from like, I don't know how many takes. I mean, we must have, we did yeah. so many different takes where I did it so many different ways. And right. literally what they did was they just cobbled it together. Cause I remember seeing it and being like, oh wait, that was from a different take. And, oh, that was, that angle was from a much different take. And they just put it together. So that performance is was created out of editing. Like I, I feel like you know, because sometimes I was super snooty, and other times I was just a little snooty, and um, they had me do it all, run the gamut for that one. So that was a really I, interesting scene. I think it was a proper amount of snoot. I think so too. I think the way they did it was great. It was just shocking when I saw because I because I, I knew instantly. I'm like, oh, this is from these. That was different, and that I did that differently on that take and all that stuff. So <laughs> it's very cool. You see that though? You look. You might have a memory of the way you played it and you see the finished thing no matter yeah. what it might have been yeah and i guess suppose you might look at it differently now because you're a filmmaker as well you'd say well gee, yeah. i'm going to cut that a little bit differently me yeah. looking at that i say well i would have given cameron a close-up <laughs> because whenever i've worked with you that's what i do like all right i need this moment you get a few frames just register this notion yeah. that you're used to this kind yeah. of reaction yeah. Like not overwhelmed by what this kid just said to you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I would have given myself a close-up too. Yeah, why not? <laughs> um, Fred, Fred, I realized something is that I think you and I, I was trying to think of how many times, I think it was four spots that I worked with you on. Yeah. And the one that that I almost forgot about was that one that was like uh, called like Gorilla something. Gorilla Trades, yeah. Gorilla Trades. And so I remember you called me and I remember you were like, 
I, I think I think you just called me personally for this one. And you said, listen, this isn't a principal role. Yeah. But we really need some people to like jump up now like gorillas for this. And so I didn't get like the principal pay, but because you know, you're awesome and I'll, you know, I like working with you. I was like, yeah, you know what? I'll do this. This is, it sounds fun. <laughs> we were running, we we couldn't find enough gorillas in Tampa. We had to Yeah. Yeah. I just remember I was at a table. The spot there was a uh, was the story as a guy is moving through his life and just out of over his shoulder, just out of his sight, people are jumping up and down having just made a trade on this stock <laughs> trading platform called Gorilla Trade and they're yeah. excited and that's their way of celebrating. Yeah. Um yeah. yeah, and we we did call you and you were the guy we would call in when yeah. we needed some acting. You can feel good yeah. about that. Like I need someone that's to right. play the dad. He's he's going to have a moment here. Yeah. That's what television commercials are. They're 26 second films. Exactly. And you know you, you don't have enough, a lot of time, you know, 26 seconds. Cause most of them are 30 seconds and you got to cut the logo. Of course. So, so often I need it in one shot and I, yeah. I need someone who can give me that variation enough yeah. to where when I'm in the editing room, I'm like, all right, I got something here to where this human moment. And that's yeah. what it is. A human moment. Uh, that moment. and the, uh, the other one, one of my favorites of all time is the one with the tux and dying, tying the tie. That was, that was a great one, you know? Um, yeah, so we got, well, I need, I need a, a helper at some point who can kind of be in the background as this is coming up in real time and just find all this and we've got it ready to go. <laughs> it'll take me three minutes and yeah. we're lose our audience. Yeah. Now I want to do, I want to move on because you're sure. in the new Kevin Smith movie. Is that yeah. right? Kilroy yeah. was here. Um, I'm sorry, say again. Kilroy was here. Is that the name? Kilroy of the movie? was here, which who knows when that's coming up because I think it got a lot of buzz over the summer because he was going to sell it as an NFT and whoever bought it had to distribute it. And it was like the first Hollywood film to be sold as an NFT. NFT. I don't NFT. know if that's a gimmick or if it's brilliant. It, it, maybe, uh, I, it sounds I, interesting. Yeah, it sounds interesting. I, I was sort of like, cool, because we're getting a lot of attention. It was in all the yeah. trades and everything. It was like got a lot of attention. For them. But I'm like, but is anyone... Is it going to wind up seeing this thing? Because I want that scene for my reel. Because I'll tell you that that scene in that movie is probably the first like substantial scene I've had in a movie where I'm not like a cop or a doctor or just some guy. You know, um, I mean, my character has a name. It, it, it's one scene, but it's a really good scene. Yeah. So I'm hoping, <laughs> I'm really hoping it comes out because I really want to see it. And what was it uh, like? Did you get to work with Kevin Smith? I imagine. Yeah, yeah. So Kevin Smith directed and it. Kevin Smith these days, right? He's lost a lot of weight. Yeah. So it was, it was after his surgery. Um, and he, it's funny because he actually, there was a small possibility that he wasn't going to direct the scene I was in because his doctor only allowed him to work, said, listen, you can only work so many oh, days a week. Yeah. And this was like, I think one of the last days of filming and they were like, well, he might not be there that day to actually direct the scene. They might have somebody else direct it. I think was it we did the special effects of Robert Kurtzman. He might have come in to direct. I can't remember, but yeah. that's not what happened. Kevin Smith came in. He did it, and so it was me uh, and with Kevin Smith directing. And Chris Jericho was my scene partner, who's a wrestler. I don't know if you know Chris Jericho, but he's like a professional wrestler, and who was who was actually great. Like I didn't know Tr Chris Jericho very well, but he can act, man. He was really good. Like he was a great <laughs> scene partner. You didn't have um, to carry him like you thought you might have. No, no, it was. It's a really intense, really good scene. Um, and yeah, it was just cool to be like on set with Kevin Smith, like, and kind of, you know, between takes, I'd chat with him about stuff and like, he's, he's exactly who you think he'd be and what you want him to be, which is a very cool guy who's laid back, loves movies, has a lot of respect for actors and, um, is just cool. Like he's just a nice dude, you know? Yeah. Um, so that, that was pretty great. I Like I said, I hope it does indeed come out. The only regret I have is that Kevin Smith is known for like, he'll take pictures with everybody. I stupidly left my phone somewhere. It got moved. So right after I finished filming, I'm like, I gotta find my phone because I gotta get a picture of me and Kevin because like, I really need this picture. So I was like, hey, where's my phone? And they're like, oh, it's over there. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. I'll go over there. And they're like, oh no, they brought it back to base. I'm like, oh, well, what? And so by the time I got my phone, like he was off doing something else. And I was like, I all right. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're old school. The, the younger generation wouldn't think of coming to work without having their phone on their person. I, I, I it was all just, about the work. 
It was so stupid I because I, I was driving a car in this thing and I should have just put it under my seat in the car. But like, I was like, oh, I shouldn't really have it with me. I should just have, I'll put it like, I put it aside somewhere on the set and it just got moved. You know, someone was like, oh, somebody's phone. Let me just move that over here, you know? And um, so like a dummy, I didn't put it in the, in the car with me, which I should have. Um, but yeah, it, it was very cool. And I'm hoping, uh, so I'm hoping it comes out because I, I really want to see that. Um, because it's uh, like I said, out of everything I've done, it's probably the most substantial thing. So, and it's this. I was looking at it on IMDb. It's a horror anthology. Yeah. Uh, which is, but I a Kevin Smith horror film. Yes. Uh, so I yes. Thinking, okay. Well, we I've seen Tusk. I mean, that kind of yeah, it's kind that's of, pretty it's kind of going in that direction. Yeah, yeah. I think this one has a good, from what I've seen from the preview, it's got a good sense of humor uh, about it. But, you know, it's got his daughters in it and Jason Mewes is in it. So it's got all the, you know, all those usual yeah. people. Um, but yeah, I think he filmed it over like a two year period because he had to stop because of his heart thing. And then he came back and finished it later. And uh, so we'll see what happens. Maybe it'll come out after Clerks 3. Who knows? Um, yeah. I so. saw. I'm switching gears a little bit. I'm going to talk about your past. I'm going to go back quite a bit because I saw something cool. on your Facebook page. I thought, well, that can't be real, but it is. You went to high school at the Baltimore School for the Arts. Yeah. Prestigious Baltimore School for the Arts. And it's not just prestigious because you went there. You had some very famous, or they weren't famous then, but they would soon become very famous. Yeah. High school yeah. classmates. Yes. Yes. One of them, I'll go ahead. I'll go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Say these names. One of them, was Jada Pinkett. That's right. Jada Another Pinkett. was Tupac Shakur. And for you kids right. out there, I mean, look both of them up. T yeah. P A C. He was yeah. important. Both of them very, very yeah. important. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, you and then also it, Josh Charles, right? Josh Charles did. Yeah. 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 He did. It's funny. I feel like Josh is one that people don't know his name as much, but I'm like, okay, sports night. The good wife, like, oh yeah, I know. Like they yeah. know who he is. Like they've seen him. He, um, yeah. Funny, funny thing about that is that because Josh was kind of, even when he was at school for the arts, was kind of almost out the door before he finished because he did Hairspray, the original movie Hairspray, John Waters. John movie. Waters, yeah. And well, of course, you're in Baltimore, so right. We were in Baltimore at the time, and then um, he left. I took over a part for him in a this production that we did outside of school. It was sort of attached to the school, but it kind of was its own thing for Baltimore City Life Museums. And um, Josh went and did Dead Poet Society. So I took over his role for a little bit while he was doing Dead Poet Society. Um, the only thing I remember that was asking, like, what's Robin Williams like? And he's like, he's pretty cool, you know? <laughs> That's pretty much it. So jo yeah, Josh was the one that was sort of out of the gate was like, he had connections and really early on, and he, I, don't, I don't know that he even finished School for the Arts. I think he left before he even finished. Um, I mean, he might have finished later, and I don't know about it. But um, but Jada and Tupac were in my class. We were classmates. Um, we did shows together. Uh, I considered both of them like good, you know, good friends. I mean, actually, I was I was pretty close to Tupac in school. Like we didn't really, you know, I was a kid from the suburbs. I lived like forty minutes from the school. Uh, in the suburbs, very, you know, white middle-class existence. And I bust in every day to downtown Baltimore to go to this school, smack in the middle of the city. Um, so, and I didn't really have, like, it wasn't like we hung out a lot after school because I just had to go home. I had to catch my bus, you know, and I didn't really, you know, I didn't really, I, well, I did have a car, but it didn't work very well. So I didn't drive to school very much. So I think Tupac and I might've hung out a little bit outside of school, but for the most part, we were just really good friends in school. And um, what was I remember- Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. My, my question is, well, what was the culture like with, because obviously you have one classmate in, in Josh Charles who, who had gone on yeah. to really big things. Yeah. So I would think the tendency would be like, well, wait a minute, that's what we're all supposed to do. And I would think you'd push each other, but what was the culture like working? And and I want what I'm getting at is studying the craft of that, right. which so, yeah, I mean, all this auditioning. I mean, it's not luck. It, I mean, right. there's some degree of it, but there's a craft to this. There is working on it for a long time. I'm curious as to what that was like in high school, beginning in, in high school with what we so, now know were really famous people or went on to famous careers. School for the Arts was a very unique school in that your half of your day was academics. You had four periods of academics and then the rest of your day 
was your discipline. We had dance, art, music, theater. Um, and um, so the, and it was in this, it's in this wonderful, it still is, it's in this wonderful building called the Alcazar uh, building and which used to be a hotel. So it's this really oddly configured building. It's kind of wonderful, it's like a seven story building. So the upper floors are all academics. The lower floors tend to be your art disciplines. Um, and it's funny because they've actually expanded since then too, which is cool. They bought a building behind the school and kind of built these like, like, you know, walls to go between them. And so like you, you at one point you kind of like almost like walk into an indoor alleyway to get to the other building, to the other offices and stuff. It's really neat. Um, it's changed a lot since I've been there. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. Um, so, so it was a really, it was like a conservatory basically. And you had to audition to get in. Um, and they only had three, only had 300 students in the entire school. Like my graduating class was 50 people, you know? And uh, each theater class, we it was about 15 people in each class or less. Um, so we, it was treated like, I mean, it was, pretty much like going to college, like a conserv like a college conservatory for theater. I mean, I learned so much there that when I went to college, it was almost like, like, this is kind of like, you know, I mean, this, I got, I got better training in high school, you know, not, 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 I, my college was great, but like, I, it was just so intense there, you know, because all of our teachers were, were working artists. They all directed, acted, whatever. So we were being taught by people who were still professionals. Um, and so the, the culture there was more about the art than it was about the business. So, I mean, all of us wanted to do cool stuff, but yeah. I, in particular, I was like, I don't know how to be, a, I know how to act, but I don't know how to be a professional actor. And for me, it took me a very long time to figure out, and you know, sometimes I still don't think I figured out, but like being good at the business side, it's not my inherent thing. I'm that stereotypical actor, you know, it's like, I just want to act, man, you know. I've learned about the business and I'm probably much better now, but um, it took me a while because I, you know, I just took it for granted. Like, okay, I'm in school and I'll go out and I'll just start getting jobs. Like, <laughs> I don't know how that yeah. works. Some of it's going to work. Take on the world as an artist. Yeah. yeah so it was, it was really about like, and, and they really were very discouraging about like, this is not about fame. This is not about money. You're not here to be, this isn't like the movie fame. We don't, we don't care about fame. They're like, we care about you learning this, art and we're very serious about it. And that's what we're going to do here. We're going to study and we're going to learn and you know, there you go. So that's, that's what it was. So it was, it was pretty intense, but it was, it was great. I wonder because so much of it now is it, it's still acting of course, but it is yeah. how big is your following? How many, you know, right. there's, there's a, there's yeah. a piece of there's that. that. Too. <laughs> there's that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, I, now, in, you know, now in schools and in the 90s, it wasn't like this, but in, now in schools, like, I, I, you know, in, in colleges and stuff, they actually do more like business of acting and business of and and I don't hard. remember any of that stuff when I was in yeah. school. No one ever talked about it. You know, you just kind of you just kind of go like, OK, you're great. And they kick you out of the nest and you, you know, try to flail your way into a career, you know, so. Sure. Yeah. Well, I can say in my senior year of high school in Miami, just regular old honors English, there were two future best-selling authors in that English class. And I was not one of them. Oh, so, come on. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we should all learn learn the business of it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I yeah. can say, I, I, can't, I can't talk about the details of it, but I, I do have two projects that are out there in Hollywood that have been bought mm. and purchased or being sold around, sold, shopped around. Mm. Yeah. What I can say with certainty, I'm learning the business from the inside, is that it's, it's, it's all about if you know if I could make friends with a star actor and bring this yeah. project, I, mean, I could go right to the top it of is. the list. Now there aren't that many of them, right. but I can say that if you get to a certain point somehow, some way, you're not auditioning for anybody. In fact, you're picking and choosing. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. what's interesting about it is that to a certain extent, that that fellowship the number of Instagram followers and so forth, that does become a currency. Um, mm. It's not enough mm. to necessarily make you a star per se. Right. There are right. kids out there with 5 million followers, 10 million yeah. followers, 15 yeah. million followers, and they're being evaluated. And someone yeah. will always ask, I'll say, but can they act? Can they be that? You know, Hollywood isn't right. quite ready to say, well, just because you have 18 million Instagram right. followers, right. you get the part. 
Right. Uh, I can say that. And I'm sitting there thinking, well, I'm pretty sure as a marketer, I, I'm pretty sure I could sell something with when someone has 18 million followers, but yeah, I'm not calling the shots. From, from what I understand now, at least, you know, actors in my position who are just guys who, you know, I mean, um, you know, people who are doing like sort of, you know, day player work or working a few days on a movie or whatever, they're, they're not as concerned about that kind of stuff for, for that, you know, maybe some of the major stars, but at my level at this point, um, you know, I don't think, I don't, I don't think it's going to make or break me getting a role in, you know, a small role in a movie or, or even a medium sized role in a movie. But, but if it starts, if my career gets on a roll and you better believe I'm going to start, you know, uh, figuring out how to get more Instagram followers and all that. Cause yeah, that's going to, that's going to make a difference at that point, you know? And um, so, yeah, I think, I think it's really smart. I mean, I know there are people who literally teach like how to social media, you know, to gain tons of followers yeah. and stuff. So, and I, I probably will, especially with the filmmaking, I, I probably should be doing that because that's something else I want to get into. So. Well, yeah. And I can say to get to those kinds of levels or even to get to a hundred thousand. Yeah. Followers. But chances are those young people have been in something. They've been in a successful exactly. show. They've been, exactly. you know, they, they've a lot of these young kids and, and we've worked yeah. with a lot of teens or, or talked with a lot of up and coming teens. They've been pro actors since they were eight, nine. Yeah. And, yeah. and they start working out there in Disney and they land their sure. first show sure. and, and they're, they're somebody by age 11, 12. And of course, yeah. a lot of them are so talented. They're, they're musicians and they're putting out music and you know, they just, they're artistic machines. Yeah. Uh, so, but they are talented. Um, there's no question about that. Yeah. But it certainly is a currency. I'm checking here. I, I'm not sure if I can see if anyone's asking any questions. Oh, we're, we're learning a lot this first time out here. Um, yeah. We're streaming live to Facebook, LinkedIn and YouTube show. I can't, I can't there, tell there's somebody by age 11. Oh, well, man, a sec. Let's skip that. Well, in any case, if you have yeah. a question, if you think if you think we're doing okay, post it up. I want to talk <laughs> about magic. Magic? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, that's an interesting story. Your, your acting has yeah. taken you across America. Yeah. But your magic has taken you across the pond to it's multiple weird. countries yeah. in Europe. Yeah. Is it weird? How did you get into that? How did you so start man, so so the story goes like this. So uh, before I lived here, I lived in New York for about three and a half to almost four years. But I was working at the Hippodrome a lot in Gainesville. I would I would go down to work at the Hippodrome and I did a lot of shows there. And what happened was when, when I went down around 2003, I met uh, the I met a woman, she became my wife. Um, and uh, we're, we're no longer married, but we were married for a long time. And um, she, uh, the idea was you know, I was a little hesitant to move to Florida, but my thought was, well, wait a minute. I I don't have any on-camera stuff. Like all I had was theater on my resume. I had no on-camera work. So my, my thought was, and she told me, because she had done a little bit of film work and she said, well, you know, you could maybe build up your resume down here. I was like, yeah, I could. I could do some, maybe do some commercials, you know, uh, maybe I'll do some buy owner commercials. That'd be great. And, uh, <laughs> well, and lo and behold, it happened. A dream come true. No. Um, and, and I was like, build up my resume and then we'll move back. The idea was we were either going to move to LA or, or to New York. So then, you know, I'd have a little bit something on my resume to like, you know, so that it didn't look like I was a total novice. Um, and only because I figured Florida is a smaller market, I'd probably be able to break in a little more easily. Uh, not, not that it's easy, but you know, a little more easily. So that was the idea, but then something happened called the financial crisis of 2008, which meant um, my wife had a business and that was tied up. So we couldn't go anywhere, right? Like we were kind of like here in Florida and in Gainesville all the time, even though I was commuting to audition for in Orlando and Tampa a lot. So what basically wound up happening is here I am in Gainesville, not a lot going on except a lot of auditioning and just, hanging out. And, uh, I just, you know, I'd always loved magic. And basically I was looking for something to fulfill me creatively in the, in between times, because I'm a person who I just have to always be creating something, whether it's writing scripts or at, right now making movies or, you know, and magic suddenly piqued my interest again, because I don't know, I could do it in my, you know, in my underwear, sitting at my computer, you know, watching a uh, tutorial and doing card tricks. I'm like, cool. I can, this is like fulfilling a creative need. Um, 
So it started off as just sort of a little hobby. And then it, what happened was it turned into like, I, I had sent a couple of my tricks to this guy in England who I really admired. And I was like, Hey, I think you might like some of this stuff just to sort of like a reaching out kind of a thing. Like just, you know, and he's like, yeah, I really like this. Can I put this out? Can I release this as a marketed trick? And I was like, yeah, cool, man. Yeah, go for it. Like that's, that's neat. I'd love to have something out there. And then it just kind of snowballed. And I started working with another guy out in England. And he's like, do you want to come out here and film some DVDs, like magic instructional DVDs of your material that you've created? And I'm like, well, why not? Because if there's one thing I know, like I, I, part of me was like, I'm not really ready for that. Like I just started doing this stuff, you know, again. And I was like, you know what? Why not? Like, what have I got to lose? Yeah, sure. I'll go out to England. And film but these are original tricks. Yeah, these are original tricks that I, I created. I mean, basically, yeah. that's where all my creative energy was going because, you know, in between acting jobs, I was like, I just got to have something to do that's like creative. Um, so I'd make up card tricks and like, you know, because I, I was voraciously reading magic books and it just inspired me. And I was like, oh, cool. Yeah. What if I took this idea and this idea and kind of did this and, you know, um, so that's how it snowballed. And then it just turned into something like a, a side career that at times was, especially after the financial crisis when, and you probably know this, Fred, uh, you know, commercial. Not a lot of commercials. Yeah, no. Lying up. Like there was yeah. nothing for a couple of years. I had like so few auditions from like 2008 to like 2010. It was like a ghost town. So magic kind of picked up the slack. I was like doing tricks and putting out DVDs and making, making a little money doing it. Um, not great money, but good money. It was, it was okay. Um, and getting to travel. So, um, so that's how it started and it kind of continued and, and it's, it's been kind of an up and down thing for me. Like sometimes I'll, I'll come up with some stuff and release some stuff, but overall I never had any aspirations to be like a per full-time performing magician or anything like that. I just really like the creative process coming up with stuff and releasing it out to the world. Uh, so that's, that's sort of how that got started. And this is, it, you're calling it, it's up close magic. Uh, cl close up magic. Close yeah, up yeah. Magic, excuse me. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've, I've, I'm on your YouTube channel right now. We should, we should show yeah. everyone a card trick and maybe we'll pick one that is a little bit shorter. Uh, Cause I'm one of these people. I could go down a rabbit hole. I love getting fooled. Well, actually, do you want me to I don't know what, how it works, but so you were selling yeah. not just the, the, the performance of the trick, but also how it, how the you secret. Do it. So that's sort of the idea. Well, your that, yeah, trick. Yeah. My okay. trick. You know, if you want, I've got one right here. I could literally show you one over Zoom if you want right now. I, that would be awesome. Let's you do, want me do that. Let me. I literally. Say, right here. I love it. A magician never reveals his tricks unless there's a financial crisis, and it's just <laughs> how you make ends meet to pay the rent. I'm well, not, magic like, is America. Most people don't realize that magicians actually there are magicians who create tricks and sell. It's a marketed. You know, there's there's a I, market. I, I didn't. Yeah. So um, let me just see here. I've got. Okay, we're gonna do this. Why not? I it's funny. I just um all right, we're gonna do this right now. Okay. So here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna tilt this down so you can see. Right, I was gonna say I, this is sleight of hand. We can't see anything. So no, no, you're gonna see it. It's right here. Boom. Okay, fantastic. I've got this deck of cards. This is gonna be like my imagination deck, if you will. Okay. Now, uh, and let me show you what I mean by that. <laughs> is that I've got these cards. So you'll notice the backs look like normal card backs, right? They just look like regular cards, yeah? Backs all look normal. Here's where things get weird is that the faces are not normal because they're all completely blank. They're just blank faces, nothing on them. The whole deck is just blank. So Fred, what I want you to do is, um, once you use your imagination, let's say, we'll start with a suit. Let's say we have four suits hanging in the air and you reach up, it's a club's heart, spades and diamonds. You reach up, you pluck one out of the air. Which suit do you pluck out of the air? And I should tell you. Yeah, just tell me, yeah, just say I'll it. I'll pick a diamond. A diamonds. So yeah. diamonds is the suit. Oh, did you actually say the full, did you say the jack of diamonds? No, no I, I just said I just said the suit, sorry. Should I oh, say oh, the diamonds? Well? Okay, great. So we'll use diamonds, that's fine. Um, all right, so we've got diamonds. Now, um, we're also gonna need a uh, value to go with it. So let's say we have a little roulette wheel and it's got ace, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, jack, queen, king on it. We spin it, tick, 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 tick. What does it land on? Which which value does it land on? It landed on the four of diamonds. So four of diamonds is the card that you've just created in your mind using your imagination, right? Uh -huh. Funnily enough, 
I know exactly where the four of diamonds is in this imagination deck, because like I said, it looks like, like there's nothing here, right? But using my imagination, I can see that right here is the four of diamonds. Look at that, the four of diamonds in the flesh. Now I know it's kind of difficult to see that, but Fred, you have an amazing imagination. And what we're gonna do right now is put it to the test. I want you to imagine that you were looking at that blank canvas that we just saw. Now I want you to imagine that on that blank canvas burns, the image of the four of diamonds just burns onto that blank canvas in your, in your mind, right? So you can see the red diamonds appearing in the four. And then I want you to imagine that that card flips over inside this deck. Can you imagine that? I see it, yep. All right, you see it in your mind's eye. Now I know you have a strong imagination, so let's see how strong it really is. So right here in the cards here, you'll notice there's all these cards and there's now one face down card. Look at that. One face down card in the deck. Now, wouldn't it be amazing? Wouldn't it be incredible if the one face down card that we just saw was actually the four of diamonds? <laughs> well, if there's a recession anytime soon, I think you're just making an audition for your next corporate gig. <laughs> we can't hire you for the commercial. <laughs> See, I, can, I, I don't even want to know how it's done. I just want to be tricked over and over again. Right. So there you go. That's a little something that I came up with. It's it's a marketed trick that, you know, I said that it's being sold on a website and all that stuff. So, so how, how many tricks do you have? How often do you, how often Man. are you inspired to create one of these? Is you know, like it's funny. I got a ton. I've got a ton out there. Um, like I said, I feel I you. Know, I'm looking at your website. I'm looking at yeah. your, uh, Google Cameron Francis magic. There's a lot. YouTube Cameron Francis. Yeah, there's magic. a lot. There's a lot. There's quite a bit. So yeah, I mean, there was a run there of like, you know, of a long time where I was like cranking up material. And, um, but it's funny because then once, but then, uh, you know, I realized that I was like, you know, I, I love doing this, but I really don't want this to be like, I have other things I want to do with my life. So I was like, I got to like, I got to focus on these other things I want to do. Like, you know, the, the filmmaking and stuff, which is what I yeah. started doing because I realized I kind of, like the technology had reached a point where it's like, why not start making, I mean, like, you know, I got an iPhone. I can actually make a movie now because you can get Filmic Pro and load it on your phone and suddenly you've got like a little mini cinema camera, you know. Um, I've enjoyed your movies. Uh, Thanks, like man. a lot of people being during the lockdown, I was, I'm sitting here in this room starred for content. And so you made a movie and I thought, this is okay, cool. Camera made it. And it was good. Yeah. And then like a month later, there was another. And then, another, yeah. and then another. how many did you make? And, and what period of time did you do this? You had an amazing creative output. Yeah. So what I did was I had had that. So, so it, it, what happened was about a few, couple years ago, um, I had heard that, you know, Steven Soderbergh had made a movie using an iPhone 7, right? An iPhone 7 using Filmic Pro. He had filmed this movie called Unsane. And I was like, wow, Steven Soderbergh did that? Now, I know other people had made iPhone movies, but I just assumed not having seen them. And I was like, well, I mean, how good can they look, right? Yeah. But then, like, I saw this preview and I'm like, I mean, that actually looked all right. Like, I was like, oh, it's kind of, I'm like, wow, well, what's this all about? And then I learned about the app that he was using Filmic Pro and everything. And so um, I was like, you know, I've, I've always wanted to, always wanted to make movies my whole life. That's really what I wanted to do. And I'm like, you know something? My excuse has always been no money. You know, I don't have the money. I don't know how to do it. I, I can't get this all together. And I'm like, but man, I've got a MacBook here. And, uh, you know, I got an iPhone. Like, why can't I start doing this? So then I started looking into like, into, uh, I bought uh, Final Cut Pro, right, for my computer. And I did that in early, like right in the beginning of 2020. I'm like, this year, I'm making a movie. I'm going to make a short film and I'm going to get my friends together and it's going to be great. And then COVID hits. So I'm thinking to myself, okay, but why not try this anyway? Like, why not? Like, I can just, yeah. I'm just in my apartment by myself. I could still do this, right? So I started to do it. Like, I just, I came up with one idea. Then I came up with another one, made a few comedies. And then I started making horror movies. And I think I did, I've not think I know I've done uh, eight in the last year and a half. I did eight, yeah. eight short films by myself 
You're a one man band, right? One complete one man. I mean, everything. Like I was filming myself, lighting my editing, you sound, all of it. Truly really a rebel without a crew. Rebel. It is. It was the Robert Robert all yes. the way. And I and I spent no like you know I don't count the money that I spend on the equipment because that money is just like well I'm going to use this I'm going to reuse this anyway. Right. And honestly, I didn't have to buy that much equipment to do a decent job. There's a lot of uh, very affordable equipment you can buy out there to, you know, make to, for, for um, sort of no budget filmmaking. So um, yeah, Robert Rodriguez is one of my heroes. Like I'm, I'm a too. huge fan. In fact, and, I think anyone who came up kind of, kind of with that attitude. Yeah. Of, I can do this. Oh, so Soder yeah. Soderbergh as well, because he, when did sex lies and videotape come out? Which was 89. Crazy. Yeah. So that was kind of the original, not yeah. necessarily, you know, just kind of cobbled together on whatever budget he could, yeah. he could put together. And it was a big, yeah. so. well, you know, but, but here's the thing that, that really got me. Cause like, I, I have a fe feature I want to do. Uh -huh. And again, I, I wrote it purposely so that it mostly takes place in an apartment because I'm like, I have an apartment. <laughs> I can just film in my apartment. <laughs> Um, you know, when, when you read about Robert Rodriguez and Kevin Smith, right? So Robert Rodriguez made uh, El Mariachi for $7,000. Famously for 7,000. Everyone 7, knows 000. that number. Yeah. Yeah. And Kevin Smith, I think made clerks for 16 grand, I believe. Somewhere the, I've heard between 16 and 25 and he had to largely yeah. sell his comic book collection. Yeah. And, <laughs> and credit cards and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And for those guys, what did they spend their money on? They spent their money on oh, film stock yeah. and you know, getting it developed and, and editing off. I think Robert Rodriguez, I want to say he actually, did he edit on video? I want to say he actually edited on video. Like he had a transfer, then edit on video anyway. Right. Um, whereas, yeah. whereas Kevin Smith used one of those old, you know, uh, uh, editing bays. Um, and I'm like, okay, so if those guys made those movies for that much money and what they spent their money on was just like the film to film them, I, I yeah. got, you can do I got it. endless amounts of film <laughs> on my phone or, you know, I don't have to spend my money on any of that. So I'm like, why can't I make a movie? And for even less, maybe, you know, I, I have lots of talented friends who, who, you know, want to pitch in. So I'm like, why not? So, I mean, on these shorts that I made, I would sometimes famously like famously, I would sometimes in a joking way on, you know, Facebook, Look, you know, I had a receipt for five dollars that I spent on like, you know, uh, some white makeup at Party City or something and, and a thing of fake blood. And I'd say, this is the budget for my new movie. Five dollars. Yeah. <laughs> Run that by accounting. Yeah, really. And like, you know, like this thing's going to be epic. Right. So, yeah, I just started like and, and I mean, the only other thing I spend money on is I do buy music like I buy stock music on Audio Jungle just to like have some, you know, something that sounds decent. Uh, but that that's cheap too. I mean, you can buy stuff for like, you know, a few dollars, you know, um, on stock music sites. Sure. So, so it just was something that, you know, and it's funny because I feel like the magic, there's a lot of directors who are also magicians. Orson Welles famously, he was a, a, a great magician actually. Um, you know, um, <laughs> literally a magician, not 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 just a magician behind the camera. He no, no, no. Orson Welles was a he he loved uh, magic. He did stage illusions. He did close up. Um, George Melies, you know, one of the first mm -hmm. filmmakers ever, started as a stage magician. And I think there's a reason why people who like magic tend to also like movies is because movies they it's like the ultimate magic trick, isn't it? It's it's making a, an absolute total illusion. It's selling an illusion, you know. Um, and I think that, you know, in a way, like, you know, I've, I've always been drawn to magic because I, I love the idea of creating these sort of, you know, uh, uh, fantastic things that, that aren't real, but, you know, it, it, it elicits some kind of emotional response. And I think that now that, now that I'm doing more of this movie making thing, I'm like, this is where it's at. I'm like, this is what I've always wanted to do is like make movies and, you know, uh, so, yeah. I only could go back in time to say like 1995 with that yeah. iPhone and that, that laptop. Yeah. You could, you could just gun past everybody, man. I know. Great. Because you know, part <laughs> of the thing is, is that part of the reason I didn't do it before was because all I, I had video cameras and stuff, but like, mm -hmm. I was always like, man, this looks like crap though. It's a freaking video camera. Like I, I don't want to make some on a video. Like I want to make it look good, you know? <laughs> and so like, you know, you, but with something like filmic pro where you, you can do things like set your ISO and, you know, uh, uh, um, 
you know, your your uh, uh, shutter speed and all that, and and actually make it look proper. It's like it doesn't look; it looks pretty darn good. Um, and that's what Apple's selling now with essentially yeah. the newest iPhone. They're kind of showing yeah. where you can make a Hollywood movie. I mean, yeah, I, I have a twelve. I have a twelve Pro Max from last year. I did my actually my the last movie I did was filmed with this thing, and it looks it looks really good. I mean, I feel like I can see the difference between this and the ten. Yeah. But I did recently invest in a uh, Lumix uh, S5 digital camera, which, oh, it looks so good. I'm so happy. I can't wait to actually do something with it. Well, you know, yeah, and, and having gone through this from 2005 until essentially now, yeah. back when, when even professionally, digital was making tremendous strides and everyone had to talk about the camera and there were hundred thousand dollar cameras and there were four thousand dollar cameras and what could yeah. you make with the four so all the way through it there was a spell there where you couldn't make a film and it, it's almost as if it couldn't be judged before people knew well what did you shoot that on yeah how much magic did you put into that and uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah a lot of the fun for us and, yeah. and doing this professionally at grown man brand and studying this and helped learning the ins and outs from professionals who had worked in film and understood yeah. optics and just the nature of, well, yeah. if in a perfect world, here's what you're going for. How can yeah. you make the tools do that? Yeah. Which, you know, you've, yeah. you've kind of got that. The, the stuff is good now. You know, there was a time yeah. when yeah. I bet, I bet you now most of the stuff we're looking at, even at the highest end on Netflix, Amazon, and so forth is digital. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Just cheaper and the workflows are so much faster and no one can can tell the difference. I mean, not so maybe just 10 years ago. Yeah. I mean, I mean, maybe the biggest filmmakers like um I wouldn't be surprised if Clint Eastwood is still shooting on film and I, yeah. I don't want him to change. Yeah. You know, yeah. Don't don't, I mean, don't, don't don't worry about digital now, but I know Christopher Nolan will shoot Nolan on nothing. But film. Yeah. yeah. Um and you know but, what? He's earned that right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, say, you know, absolutely. But I mean, like for someone like me who, you know, it's like, it's like, yeah, I just basically want something that looks good that, it, you know, I can do inexpensively. So digital it is. <laughs> all right. We got it. Now that, now that we're talking about all this, we've got to give me a moment here because I've got to pull a real blast from the past. And yeah, someone did ask like, well, how long are you going to be on tonight? And I said, I think we're going to talk until we're just sick of each other. But we, we, okay. we can't we can't, we can't wrap it up. We've been going about an hour, but we can't we can't leave until we show this here. Just bear with me here. Oh, uh, is this what I think it is, Fred? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm gonna set this up a little bit. Yeah. Back in about probably 2006, I'm gonna say it was 2006. I got together the best, most talented people who had come through the commercial auditions and said, "Okay, we're gonna make a movie." And it's actually, it's going to be a movie about making a movie because that's where I was in my life at this time. And I, I had decided Cameron was going to be the lead. You're going to be the lead because you're the guy. So I had all the best actors who had come through and I'd pieced together this script. And this was, it was a scene that we made to kind of prove the concept, but it was enough for us to all look at it and say, yeah, let's keep going. Let's, let's give the, that's the way I remember it. So let us play this. Now I will say, this was shot on video in probably 2006 and it was compressed yeah. in, in either a pre YouTube world or an early YouTube world. So if you remember back then, yep. you couldn't just make a 200 megabyte, anything you had to compress right. it down. And so it might be a little jiggly, might be a little moving around, but I think you'll still get the idea here. Excellent. Let's add this up and take a look. So how's the script coming? Script. It's um, well, it's a piece of shit. <laughs> it's 162 pages of spineless characters talking about nothing. It's long, boring, and pointless. It reads like a high school civics textbook. I'm a hack. I've got no business writing screenplays. You were an award-winning copywriter. You wrote two commercials that won Clio's. Yeah, this one I was an advertising. I could be a get-free hack. Like those are the good old days. I'd be lucky if I could get a job writing greeting cards right now. Jesus, smiley, get over it. So you're in a slump and the script sucks, but cheer up. <laughs> it gets worse. We got bigger problems. Like what? Well, 
No casting agents have called us back, so there's no cast. Stan dropped out to do a real movie, so there's no camera or film. Our location scout disappeared, so there's no locations. And even if there were, the film commissioner won't give us the time of day, so there's no permits. But none of that really matters since our investor, our only investor, pulled the plug, so there's no budget. Wait a minute. <laughs> Did you say no film? You mean we have to shoot this on video? <laughs> <laughs> And then we turn this into a trailer. Yeah, it's um, it's my it's Cameron Francis at his most Michael J. Fox ish. <laughs> because I that little it. thing was like, you know, shoot this on video. It's like it's it sounds like Doc, you the time machine out of a DeLorean. Like it totally <laughs> has that vibe to it. It's not who you steal it from; it's where you take it to. Yeah, exactly, man. If yeah, stuff in the back there. How many times I went to the close up, or at least the reaction of you twice when someone yeah. else, when Nevada, the great yeah. Nevada, called yeah. well. Is speaking because yeah. and it, it's right there when she says we have no film and yeah you register like wait a minute every, these other no budget no script we can come around on that yeah we're doing that film and the thing about that joke is that it would have played well then because yeah. commercials were still all most commercials certainly at at, at elitist advertise they would have been on film very right. much so. movies were obviously on film and digital looked the way it did or it wasn't even necessarily digital then uh uh video looked the way it did yeah and so what i knew is what you just said a moment ago we could never afford the film we couldn't even afford if we're going to make this movie cigar city amateurs the crew to make it look good right yeah so yeah. i i had to apologize early with this scene but what i like about it looking at it back i haven't looked at this in a long time the scene kind of captures everything that the movie's about. I realized it, I wrote it 15 years ago. And mm. at that point in my life, making a movie was the biggest thing I could do in my artistic life. I've since then done that. But then it was this thing that I'd built up that was the most important thing in my life, just like Smiley. And the whole movie in the script that was Cigar City Amateurs, scene by scene, the dream unravels. And it's not what he expected it to be. And one, it's just one disaster after another. But it's Nevada, her character, saying, cheer up. It gets worse. This is life. This is it. This is the experience. And I think yeah. it's so true. And we yeah. were going to make this. And it, we, I, again, I ran, rallied together the best actors. And some of them were so convinced it was going to get made, they actually put it on their headshots. Because <laughs> you know, back then, headshots were something you had to think about in advance. Like, okay, yeah. my resume... Yeah. So I, yeah. I called a couple of the actors out on it. Like, I noticed you got this. Like, well, I thought we were going to make it. So I just figured yeah. I'm not on their film credit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I, I have a rule about that. I never put anything on my resume until I've shot it. So like, but the day I shoot it, it goes right on IMDb and right on my resume. Um, uh, the flip side of that is when you actually do make a movie with somebody. Yeah. And it's on their, their, their headshot and that's great. But eventually they move on to other stuff and you get pushed down the list. And yeah. you, you're one of those available on requests. Like you're off, like they have bigger things to, to hire. Yeah. We ended Man. up. Yeah. Oh no, go ahead. Sorry. We ended up, I was, I was all set to do this, all set to do this. And then I just got, I aged just enough to where I had just a different story in mind completely different. It was about yeah. a nine-year-old girl and I made it with Nevada Yeah, because it was a nine-year-old girl whose parents pass away. Yeah, That's the backstory. She goes and lives with her aunt and she, who's Nevada, and they go on this filmic adventure and they send movies to her parents in heaven through the internet, which I thought was a really cool hook. That is a cool Yeah, I wrote this in 2007. I think we made it in 2008 and the internet, oddly enough, it was new enough then or YouTube, like content wasn't as easy to put up then as it is now. So it was right. possible that someone might, a kid might think, and there's a nice, wonderful twist. And when I, even when I show it now, there's parts in it where people cry, like, you, you know, and because the, most of the movie is made with the, the video camera, you know, it's like the Blair Witch Project. The camera right. is, is a character in the story. Right. You're off the hook. Yeah. Like no matter how you light it or how you compose anything, you, you know, make it, but you're off the hook. Like people will, oh, that it should look that way. Because yeah. the little girl is shooting a movie. And so exactly. it's, I guess it stood out because at the time, everyone everyone then was making horror movies. There were a lot yeah. of horror movies in the mid 2000s. Some of them were amazing. Yeah. And horror, a friend of mine said this back then horror movies like punk rock. It doesn't necessarily matter how slick or polished or produced it is. If it's got heart, if a horror movie has heart in the right place, the audience will forgive all that. 
and yeah. go with you on that journey. And I think that's true. Yeah. Uh, but there's a lot of bad punk rock out there. <laughs> Just true. A, a lot of bad horror movies, but yeah. your stuff. Now let's get back to good horror movies. Cause we could, we could probably show a clip of one of yours. <laughs> I like it because you, yeah. you figured out how to keep us waiting, waiting on the edge of our seat. And is he going to scare us here or, or something's going to jump out at us, which again, I love being thrilled. I love, I don't yeah. want to, I want to play dumb and not yeah. try to see it coming. Yeah, my I think the one that I my not it's not my favorite, but one of the ones that, that does that successfully is the one I did with my daughter called Lindsay. I finally convinced my daughter to do I really wanted her to be in one of these little movies. I'm like, it's just me. I just want someone else in them too. And she's like, I don't want to do it. And I said, How about your you get to kill me at the end? She goes, Okay, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> so so she, you know, her her little she plays a little ghost and she gets me at the end. I, I that one I imagine, yeah, spoiler alert, but I could imagine I could imagine her trying to rewrite that script. Like, I'll do it, but I have to kill you in the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really. Yeah. Yeah. Spoiler okay. alert when you watch it. Um Is there um, a can we can we scrub ahead to I I have it queued up. It's about Yeah, you can you can eight minutes yeah, whatever, long. Yeah. Not that whatever. we necessarily need to let's see here. Whatever it is. So I don't know if we want it. Is there is there a point of it you want to go to, or do you, you want to? Um, it doesn't really matter, man. If you want to go toward the the the, if you wanted this the scare at the end or whatever. I already what told it. you the ending. Dad is yeah, we, this one. Yeah. Well, let's pick it up right about here. You you're you're playing to your strengths in terms of blocking your own scene here. We've got it's here. amazing, a, like a classic Cameron Francis close up, and he's ready <laughs> yeah. using all that training to register that something is amiss here. Yes, yes. And I, actually, it's been a while since I've seen this, so I might. Oh, yeah. The super tall boy beer. Yep. It's funny. That was a, that was a re, I redid this because I wanted something else there. And I, I just thought it was funny to like look at the frame, like, what the hell happened to that thing? go it's a slow burn that whole thing is a slow burn but i kind of love i like a slow burn i like the you know and that one that one this one actually had a a slightly higher budget than the other ones because my daughter wanted makeup so i had to buy her a bunch of makeup and it cost a fortune i was like how much i never knew how much makeup was until we went to cvs and had to buy some <laughs> probably have to feed her too and... yeah i had to feed her yeah she's not she's like, union. Well, need makeup i was like she's okay let's go buy you some makeup non-union but... i'm sure you can overwork her and yeah, yeah, exactly. We're in yeah. Florida after all. It's a right to work state. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Google, Google Cameron Francis, uh, YouTube Cameron Francis. He's uh, at least, right, eight videos, countless magic videos yeah. out there. You're like yeah. me. You just go down the rabbit hole and you want to get scared or tricked. Yeah. Right. Dichotomy working. There work. you go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, this, it was been fantastic. I've, I've enjoyed this. This is good. If you two cancel us, we might have to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> so, so now who's who's your, now, you know who's your next guest going to be? Who's, who, well, who's I'm hoping I'm hope, there are a few that I hoped uh, watch this, but I got yeah. a lot of friends. It's not limited to actors, of course. I have a lot of magicians. You're my only magician friend. I have a lot <laughs> we of have musicians. I have a lot of musicians, <clears throat> yeah. uh, writer friends, um, comedians. You know, <laughs> this will make you feel good. I have them sort of layered in terms of well that person would certainly do anything with me i've known him a long time this person would probably appreciate the, the exposure this person i gotta work up to because they're actually yeah. a little famous they got something going on yeah 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 but, yeah uh you know they, hopefully 
folks will come on and um, have a good time. It's not too, it's not too much torture talking about yourself. <laughs> I would hope it's excruciating. I hated every minute of it. No, I'm but kidding. The, this is the, really the point of it is though, when someone asked me like, why are you doing a podcast? You know, there, there's so many podcasts. There are, there's, there's, the world doesn't need another podcast. I've, I've said this publicly, but yeah. the world doesn't need another horror film or another book or another song or another comedy act or another painting. The world does, the world has enough art, but here we are making it. That's right. We're we doing need, this and, yeah. and we've got to do it. And I'm most of my favorite pastime is getting with someone that I've a been who's been through it like I have and talking about art and stuff and music and movies. I mean, it's fun for me. Yeah. So yeah. Maybe it's fun for other people too. We'll see. Well, it's well, great because I feel like, you know, you, you, yeah. Like it's like we were talking about before is that, you know, it's, it's like talking to artists who aren't famous is, is interesting because we are working, but we're, we're still working artists, absolutely. right? So we still make a living doing it. That's it. And, um, you know, and I feel like the people don't really hear from, from people like me. So thank you, Fred. I appreciate the opportunity to come well, on here. Enjoy. And I, I think that's yeah. really important about the importance of, you said it a moment ago, you, you, you have to be creative. I think right. we all sort of, my friend, David Audet, who's been a great inspiration for me and a tremendous artist, photographer, writer, just visual artist. He said, it's a sickness, but it's a good sickness to have. Yeah. That's so true. And I know we all, we all have it. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. It's essential. Yeah. Well, I've enjoyed this a bunch. Me too, man. Um, I am going to make this available, assuming that the software recorded, I am going to make yeah. this available. Um, so stay tuned. It's a little bit of work here. I'm, I'm planning on maybe giving the whole thing out on, on YouTube and with links to it and so forth, but I'll probably cut awesome. it up a little bit. And I can say it depends on how much work I can do on, uh, or how much time I can sink into breaking out little snippets. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully yeah. there are snippets that'll work. Cameron Francis on getting his daughter into the movie. <laughs> <laughs> you had to kill him. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. So. Good stuff, man. Well, thanks again for having me. This has been, it's been a treat. It's been fun. It's just been fun. Like just talking. I, I almost forgot like people might watch this. I thought we were just having a conversation. So that's <laughs> the best part of this whole thing is to, and I, I feel like we, we hadn't talked in a while before you got in touch with me for this. So this has been great to reconnect. You know? Yeah, it's been a little bit. I, you're the same yeah. way as me. You got, I've got a daughter, you have a daughter. and Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you got life. And, yeah, life gets in the way. Life but after, you, yeah. Are you still living in Tampa, by the way? I just meant to. Still actually living, working in Tampa, living in Riverview. Just okay. Here and been cool. here for a while. Awesome. That's yeah, funny. We were, we were living in the Seminole Heights area of Tampa. That's where our studio is. And that became the very, very hip area of Tampa. Mm. Bars and, and nightlife and just really cool stuff. And we were, my wife and I were just aging out of that. Like we needed soccer practice. We needed. Yeah. Like, <laughs> we'll go with two and three. And so. Yeah. We moved, we moved out to the suburbs now and now have that, but. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, still, Good still thing. here and enjoying it. Tampa, you know, maybe somewhere down the road, someone who watched this said, you know, that Cigar City Amateurs is a good idea. So we can be executive producers <laughs> and they can yes. go through the hard work of, of making it. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you, great, for, thank you for being on here, Cameron. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you. Um, it's wonderful. Yeah, that's it. I think I just end broadcast. There's no big sign. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Enjoy yeah. your evening, and we're going to see everybody next time. Thanks a lot. Awesome, man. All right. See you, man. Thanks so much. You got it. Peace. Peace. I don't even know what to do. I, oh. I, I had to hit end broadcast, and it's like, are you sure you want to end broadcast? Yeah, I'm sure. I it still says live at the top of my screen. Oh, it does, because I have to hit this second button. It's like a little safety trigger. Mm -hmm.